So in this video, we're going to talk about the rock type peridotite and why it is so important. Let's start with the name. Uh, peridotite is derived from the term peridot. Let's see if we can spell it correctly. That is a D. So peridot is the gemstone name for the mineral olivine. And the reason we use this term uh, peridotite is because all of that light green stuff there and there and there, this is all peridotite that's shown in this um, uh, green area here. Uh, There's a peridotite xenolith. Uh, most of that light green stuff is olivine. There's some darker material here, and that darker material is probably pyroxene. So peridotites are a mix of olivine plus pyroxene, but they have quite a bit of olivine, and so that's why they get the term uh, peridotite from this root peridot. Now take a look at this diagram here. This is from uh, both these diagrams are from the uh, textbook by John Winter. He's showing the USGS classification of so-called ultra mafic rocks. Uh, ultra mafic means that they are ultra or they have extra amounts of mafic minerals and mafic minerals are things like olivine plus pyroxene. So rocks that are dominated by olivine plus pyroxene, these guys here, would be classified in this triangle where we compare the amounts of olivine to the amounts of orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene. This guy here, this uh, ultramafic xenolith that we're showing, would probably plot in the Lurzolite field. It would have well more than 40% uh, olivine, so this would be 100% olivine here, zero down here. Uh, this line represents the 40% mark that separates peridotites from peroxinites. This guy probably has closer to 50 or 60% uh, olivine, and we think it has more than 10% clinopyroxene. So this is a 10% boundary here. If you have less, you'd have 100% clinopyroxene if you plotted there. So things that have more than 10% clinopyroxene uh, and more than 40% uh, olivine uh, might plot here in the peridotite field as this guy does. Now I'm calling it a xenolith. This is a foreign rock. Foreign to what? So xeno means foreign, lith means rock. It's foreign to this guy here that is the carrier. That carrier is basalt. And that comes to the next part of peridotite. Why is peridotite important? Well, when peridotite is very warm, as it would be down here in the asthenosphere, there will be some partial melting. That partial melting will occur on grain boundaries, and those melts will not look the same as the parent rock. So this parent rock, this source rock of peridotite, will partially melt to produce something that is much higher in calcium and aluminum that will give us the rock peridotite. So these partial melts in the asthenosphere could rise upwards. Well, they will. They're buoyant. They're, they're less dense than the parent rock. They'll rise up and extrude to give us the continental or the oceanic crust that is shown here. So John Winter is showing the oceanic crust is this thin layer of uh, rock that is sitting here on top of this tan layer. Uh, let's come to this diagram here and talk a little bit about it first, then we'll come back to basalt. Uh, all of this material that is shown in tan and in orange and in reds are all peridotite, probably lurzolite, again, maybe with a little bit of peroxynite mixed in, but let's just call it all peridotite. The reason he shows it in tan is because this is the coldest part of the mantle, cold enough that it does not take place in mantle convection. So this stuff is warm enough and soft enough that it will flow. I'm showing a convective current here, but this stuff up here is cold and rigid enough that it does not uh, take... Um, take part in that convective flow. So this is the mantle lithosphere here, and this is the convective mantle here. They're both made of peridotite. The only differences are their temperatures. However, the oceanic crust is different. This is not made of peridotite. It is made of basalt. These basalts are partial melts. If you take this uh, rock here and melt it about 10%, then you would get something that looks like the oceanic crust or that kind of basalt. Then the final thing that's being illustrated here is the continental crust. If we let that basalt sit around and differentiate, especially in the presence of water, it'll undergo fractional crystallization. So fractional crystallization, this is a process we'll talk about again in more detail. If you let fractional crystallization take place, you can create some granite. And if you have some water, 
that allows amphiboles to form, uh, then you can create a lot of continental crust. That continental crust would be made of well, colloquially, we would call it granite, but it would be granodiorite and diorite. Uh, but we make things that are enriched in silica. So these guys here would have lots of silica, uh, maybe greater than 65 weight percent. So 65 weight percent, which just uses that as kind of a, a ballpark uh, characteristic uh, of uh, what continental crust would look like for the oceanic crust. Uh, that material would have something like uh, 49 to 50 weight percent silica typically, and then this stuff down here in the mantle would be much lower than 49 weight percent, probably on the order of um, 35 to 45 weight percent silica, depending on how much olivine we have relative to pyroxene. So we have these different parts um, of the mantle, the cold part and the warm part. Again, that's all peridotite. It's the crust. When we start talking about the crust, now we're talking about things that are made up of different rock types. They are made of different kinds of materials, different in composition, whereas the lithosphere and the asthenosphere in the lower parts of the mantle, we think are mostly made of the same kind of composition, the same kind of stuff that we would call peridotite. So peridotite is the bulk of the mantle, and it is also being partially melted, so it is the source of the salt and eventually also the source of continental crust uh, when sufficient fractional crystallization takes place to give us these uh, higher silica liquid compositions.